Hey, it's Doodle Bud here again. You know, when you shell out a pretty penny for a high-end pen, you always wonder and worry, did you make the right decision? So here we go. I went vintage. I picked up an old-school Omas with a flexi nib. Let's see if I made a good decision. So I did some browsing and picked up this pen from 10 Pen. It's run by uh, Letizia Lacopini. Included was this uh, vintage blotting paper. I haven't ever used that before. Don't know what much that's about, but also came with this nice little book. So she runs that site, 10pen.it. It's obviously in Italy and she specializes in vintage pens and knows a ton about Omos. It seems a lot of her pens are Omos pens. And uh, yeah, there's, it took me a long time to figure out what I wanted, but then when I figured out I wanted Omos, Vintage, Faceted, Flex Nib, it's sort of all roads pointed to some of these pens. Some older ones too, they have from the 1930s, but those were just out of my price range. But uh, beautiful pen, we're gonna roll through this. I haven't bought from her before. She uh, asked for a little bit of information. I'll put it in the link below, sorry, in the description below. But um, she is a connoisseur of these pens. So over 30 years with vintage pens, has actually even written a few volumes of books. Uh, I think a two volume uh, book on Italian vintage pens, which is awesome. Shows up at uh, shows as well. So I'll put a little information she provided below. And then uh, we're gonna run through the pen here as well. So I didn't know I wanted this pen. I was thinking modern. I was looking at a Pelican M1000 5 Stressman, uh, even a Santini, which looks a lot like this, but they're new and bigger. There was the Wall Eversharp Deco Band, the new big ones with the big, huge nib super flexors as well. Few other pens I was considering, one by ASC, the Armando Simone Club, or maybe a Sailor King of Pen. I was thinking of an Aboya pen, Lusso pens. There were so many other ones, but for some reason, this. I just settled on a vintage Omas. I figured that was what I was looking for. So I've been playing with this for about a week, week and a half or so. And I gotta say, it's just a lovely little writer. That's the one thing with the vintage pens. Uh, nothing writes like a vintage pen. They might not have all the flash of new pens so much and all the features and all that kind of stuff, but when it comes to writing, it seems that nothing beats it. One of my other favorite ones is this little Pelican 140 with a lovely flex nib. We'll compare them a little bit here too, but back to this one. So this is a black celluloid. It also says loosen. So I don't even know really what that means. I don't know much about these pens. So feel free if you're a vintage pen buff, comment away and share what you know with everyone else as well. But solid black, it's got a beautiful gold band. It's faceted, it's 12 sided. I guess that makes it a dodecagon, I believe. Pointed little end here, um, nice little grip section. The threads are in the grip section. I don't have any pens like that, but they, they fit superbly, super comfortable. Smaller diameter, obviously. It's sort of just big enough for me, unposted. It does post. I'm gonna put it on gently when I do, but securely, not too deep, but post quite securely. Doesn't back weight the pen because it's it's very light as it is. It's a piston filler. I'm gonna run through that with you as well. Found some interesting little details. And I was also just trying to think about how this pen was made back then with the technology they have, the materials they have, how were some of these details made? So I'm gonna roll through some of this with you, give you a writing sample. I'm not gonna go crazy engineering on it because uh, there's some things you just get and you just enjoy. And this is one of those things. So when looking online, I came across this document. So this is a US patent, patented here, as you can see in 1925, the application was filed in 1921. And it has to do with a process for making articles of celluloid in similar material. So this is quite interesting. It goes through all sorts of different details on here as well. But as, especially it comes into making uh, hollow uh, celluloid parts, right? So in here, he gives an example of making, let's scroll up a little bit here. Here we are here. These are making some balls made of celluloid and they're hollow in the middle. So it's a little bit tricky to do that's a new concept and with a pen of course the center of it is hollow now i don't know for sure if this is the process that was used but they also they use uh use some steam in here as well there if you look in and, and read the document i'll share this in the description below but some steam was used to soften the material but also used to help actually form the material the celluloid against the mold so it i don't know is this like a first early edition of what we now have with modern day injection molding 
uh, you know, I'm not 100% sure what to make of this. Now, again, just because there is a patent doesn't mean it was used. There's plenty of things that are patented that never uh, got picked up, that the process didn't work, or someone came up with a better mousetrap, of course, but thought I'd share that with you. And that does give me a few hints and a few ideas of how this pen was made. But coming back to the pen, uh, there are some marks on here that tell me there was obviously some machining being done afterwards. You could see some of the marks here on the outside of the pen here up near the end of the section and also down in here where the feed comes in. Now again, we got black on black, but you can sort of see some of the lines, some of the tooling marks in here. So that doesn't surprise me that would have been done on a lathe. But this thread here, it is quite nice. I look up close under a loop and I can't see any of the seam marks that you would have uh, from the mold. So, I mean, I guess it potentially could have been machined if it was done on a conventional lathe. Bravo. Uh, the, these are fantastic. They're very smooth, super uniform. The lead in and like and lead out that you would get from machining that, I just, I don't see the marks on there. So... Um, but it, it just seems to me these were most likely a part of the mold as well. And then when I get into the cap, this is the part that interests me the most because you have this, this seam, sort of this break right here. So we have the threads that are in there, um, but even that mark doesn't go all the way to the bottom. So that could be part of how it came out of the mold. It could be a multi-part mold and those are forced into the material. And then the uh, you probably have like a plug or something in the center to ex to expand the mold, and then you would take that out so you can get it out of there. Again, that's just me spitballing, thinking, looking at this pen. How was this made back in the day, and how could I potentially make it? I could be exceptionally wrong, and I most likely am. But yeah, this part I find interesting. How do you make stuff back in the day when you don't have all the cool technology that we have today? Nonetheless. They did a supreme job. These threads are absolutely wonderful. Multi-start thread, which a lot of pens don't even do nowadays. And super smooth, really quick to engage. You can see how long the thread is and how much distance that travels in such a short number of turns. So it's under one and a half rotations. And these threads are just really, really, really nice. So how are they made those threads? They did a fantastic job. So I have some ink, going to be using Robert Oster Ride Green. I thought that'd be a nice uh, looking ink here to go with the pen. That's what's in the sample in the background here. And it's a little piston filler. So that's, I really like that with this pen as well. Very simple, um, you know, reasonably smooth piston up and down away you go. And I do find that these little pens with these old school piston fillers actually hold a fairly significant amount of ink as well. I don't see any simple disassembly on here like there's no flats on there and uh yeah i'm not gonna, i mean i could probably find something online how to take this thing apart but uh i'm just enjoying the pen for now it's still relatively new i don't want to mess anything up so uh, let's ink it up do a writing sample so i'm just using the paper that came with the pen from 10 pen and uh right away you know no pressure at all you just have a nice fine line possibly even extra fine line and this just writes normal if you just want to do some nice printing or some cursing or whatever. You can use this as a regular print pen and just write nice and soft and you get a perfect line. But of course, you didn't come here for that. You want to see this nice, beautiful line variation. Ebonite feed, just lovely bounce. It is not a super smooth, like no feedback, you know, hot, uh, hot knife in butter type nib. It does have some feedback to it, but I find that you need that to properly control your writing as well. Um, again, some just gorgeous line variation on the pen. It really, really flexes nicely and smooth in all directions. And yeah, this thing just won't skip as well. I'm going to uh, do some writing and probably not talk and do a voiceover because it's tough to focus on the writing at the same time. But I'll just give you a quick comparison with my little Pelican 140, which has some great flex to it as well. I did end up smoothing this nib because one of the tines seemed to be a little bit longer and would just snag a little bit sometimes. Um, so this one does feel a little bit smoother just because I smoothed it. But similar flex, this one does have a touch more, uh, but the flow is even better in the OMAS. And you can see just size-wise, it is a little bit bigger than the 140. They're both still fairly small, but this one looks quite large compared to it.
here are the two nibs close up for comparison. You can see one thing to notice is with vintage pens, flex nibs are, it's very rare. I, I, again, I'm not an aficionado on this, but it's rare that they have higher than 14 carat on flex nibs. And to deal with that is just has to do with the properties of metal, the proper tempering you need. So you have to have other metals in here to get the right alloy. One, so you can form the nib the way you want, but also so it has the right properties. It has that springiness. Right away, you think the higher the gold, the better, especially when it comes to flex. But that's not necessarily correct. You need the metal to perform the way you want. So you have to have other stuff in here with the gold. A straight, you know, 24 karat gold just wouldn't work. It'd be soft but it wouldn't have that bounce, that springiness, especially that snapback. So you do need other metals in mixed with the gold to get that property that you want. So quick sizes and weights here of the pen, quite light, 16.7 grams for the overall pen. The body is just over 11, so very lightweight. It's small as well. Overall length of the pen, uh, once it's capped and secured, about 135 uncapped. We're about 123 or so for the full length of the pen. About 12 millimeters across, 11 and a half, 12 millimeters across. And uh, the section ends up tapering down to about nine-ish or so millimeters at the end. So small pen, but nice and light. And it just seems, I don't know what it is about the size. You know, with modern pens, I, I do like a larger one. But when it comes to doing flex writing, it just seems a little bit smaller. You seem to have more control and you do a better job when it comes to writing. And that's really what I bought this pen for. You can get ones that look much flashier, much cooler, cooler materials, resins, patterns, whatever, machining. We've seen a bunch from Gravitas I show. Those look super cool. Um, but having this old vintage pen for just gorgeous writing, there's just, there's just nothing, nothing else like these. So after all of that, did I make the right choice? Did I make the right decision with getting this pen? To be honest, I'm not 100% sure. Like I do, I can't help but compare it. I mean, maybe I should just review it all on its own, but you, when you have other pens, you, you're gonna compare. And you know, for a much lower price, I can get a vintage pen that works quite well and has similar flex. But I do know that a significant portion of the price I'm paying has to do with the name and everything else that goes with the pen. They're a lot more rare, the brand's discontinued. So all that stuff is sort of new for me when it comes to uh, collecting pens, right? So that's a heavy influence on the price point of this pen. I do enjoy it, it writes well, fits well in my hand. It's uh, made really well, the flex is great, all that stuff. Would I buy it again? I'm, I don't know. I'm still not 100% sure if this will be a forever pen for me or I have it for a while and I uh, I sell it and try to find something where it takes the best feature of this and maybe a few things that I'm not looking for I find in another pen. Time will tell, but we'll see. I'm quite happy with it for now and uh, we'll see how long I have this pen for. But as far as buying from a 10 pen, I've been very happy with the process and I got exactly what was described. So I'll leave it at that for now. Leave some comments so we can chat down there. Likes and subscribes are welcome. And we will, as always, catch you next time.